Olá, amigos e amigas. É, a revista Utopia do Pós-Capitalismo, o grupo Crítica Radical de Fortaleza, com o apoio da editora Boitempo, é, trouxeram aqui ao Brasil o conhecido é, intelectual canadense que ministra aulas na Universidade de Chicago, Moshe Postone. Foi um evento importante do lançamento do livro Tempo, Trabalho e Dominação Social, um livro que é, fazia falta aqui no Brasil. Esse livro é, já foi editado há mais de 20 anos na Europa, nos Estados Unidos, em todo o mundo. Né? E é um livro que tem, teve uma repercussão muito grande devido ao tema que é uma abordagem do capital à luz dos escritos do Grundes, de, de Marx, né? notadamente o primeiro tomo do Capital, onde é, Postone faz uma análise do marxismo de uma forma totalmente peculiar, é, diversa da, das concepções do chamado marxismo tradicional. Ali, nesse livro, ele trava uma polêmica com essa corrente é, do marxismo, que ele coloca como chamado de marxismo tradicional, e nesta polêmica é, ele ressalta vários aspectos que é, são importantes dentro desse livro. A vinda do Postone ao Brasil foi um evento, como disse, de máxima importância e nós fizemos com ele um encontro no Sindicato de Jornalistas do Rio de Janeiro, um encontro é, muito frutífero, onde ele fez uma palestra é, sobre os aspectos centrais do livro. Nós trazemos agora para vocês um vídeo, esta palestra, e esperamos que vocês façam bom proveito das teses que ali são levantadas. If there's a theorist, well, first of all, let me say I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. If there's a theorist who can be said to have had a significant influence on historical practice, it is Karl Marx. It could also be argued, however, that the historical practices of each generation has given rise to its own Marx, from the positivist Marx of late 19th century social democracy to the anti-positivist Hegelian Marx of the 1920s and 1930s to the existentialist and then structuralist Marx of the post-war decades. This variegated tradition as a whole have been superseded several decades ago. There was a turn away from approaches inspired by Marx and the emergence of other kinds of critical theoretical approaches such as post-structuralism and deconstruction. Nevertheless, I'm going to argue that recent historical developments suggest that Marx has renewed significance for historical practice. The far-reaching transformations of the world in recent decades have dramatically indicated that critical social analysis must be centrally concerned with questions of historical dynamics and large-scale structural changes if it is to be adequate to our social universe. They have starkly revealed the fundamental limitations of newer critical approaches as attempts to grasp the contemporary world. A focus on such transformations 
ultimately points to a fundamental rethinking of what is meant by history and temporality, a rethinking that, I would argue, can best be effected on the basis of a fundamentally reinterpreted critical theory of capitalism. Rather than considering temporality as a pre-given, unmoving frame within which all social life moves, such a theory grasps capitalism as a very peculiar organization of social life that constitutes its own historically specific temporality. It does so in as much as it is structured by unique forms of social mediation that are intrinsically temporal. These forms underlie a peculiar historical dynamic that is both historically specific and global. The temporalities of capitalism, then, are not extrinsic to it, but are intrinsic to its structuring social forms. The idea that the temporal dimensions of capitalist modernity is historically specific implies that the framing conditions for historical investigations of the modern world are also historically specific. This in turn suggests that historical investigation must seek to be adequate to the temporality of its object of inquiry rather than approaching all human societies with the same concept of temporal processes. My focus on the historically dynamic character of capitalist society responds to the massive global transformations of the past four decades. This period has been characterized by the unraveling of the post-World War II state-centered Fordist synthesis in the West, the collapse or fundamental transformation of party states and their command economies in the East, and the emergence of a neoliberal capitalist global order. These developments in turn can be understood with reference to the overarching trajectory of state-centric capitalism in the 20th century, from its beginnings in World War I and the Russian Revolution, through its high point in the decades following World War II, and its decline after the early 1970s. What's significant about this trajectory is its global character, and this is a position from the 21st century. It encompassed Western capitalist countries and communist countries, as well as colonized lands and decolonized countries. Although differences in historical development occurred, of course, from our perspective they appear more as different inflections of a common pattern than as fundamentally different developments. These general developments occurred regardless of which parties were in power and were paralleled by the post-war success and subsequent rapid decline of the Soviet Union and the far-going transformations of China. Such general developments cannot convincingly be explained in contingent terms. They strongly suggest the existence of general structural constraints on political, social, and economic decisions, as well as dynamic forces not fully subject to political control. At the same time, they call into question linear notions of historical development, whether liberal or Weberian or Marxist. These general patterns also suggest that the theoretical focus on agency and contingency in recent decades was as one-sided as the structural functionalism it superseded. If the latter achieved widespread currency during the high tide of state-centric capitalism, the former has done so new during the neoliberal epoch. Neither approach, however, thematized their own relation to their historical context. This suggests that
that unlike such approaches, a critical theory should be able to problematize its own historical situatedness. That is, it should be reflexive. Consideration of these overarching patterns suggests the importance of a renewed encounter with Marx's critique of political economies. For the problematic of historical dynamics and global structural change is at the very heart of that critique. Nevertheless, the history of the last century also suggests that an adequate critical theory must differ fundamentally from traditional Marxist critiques of capitalism, by which I mean a general interpretive framework in which capitalism is analyzed essentially in terms of class relations that are rooted in private property and mediated by the market, and social domination is understood primarily in terms of class domination and exploitation. Within this general framework, what I'm calling traditional Marxism, there's been a broad range of approaches that have generated powerful economic, political, social, historical, and cultural analysis. Nevertheless, the limitations of the general framework itself became increasingly evident in light of 20th century developments. These developments include the non-emancipatory character of actually existing socialism, the historical trajectory of its rise and decline, which parallels that of state interventionist capitalism, suggesting that they were similarly located historically, the growing importance of scientific knowledge and advanced technology in production, which seemed to call into question the labor theory of value. This is a point I'll return to. Growing criticisms of technological progress and growth, which opposed the productivism of much traditional Marxism, and the increased importance of non-class-based social identities. <coughs> Together, they suggest that the traditional framework no longer can serve as a point of departure for an adequate critical theory. In other words, consideration of the general historical patterns that have characterized the past century calls into question both traditional Marxism with its affirmation of labor and history as well as post-structuralist understandings of history as essentially contingent. Nevertheless, such consideration doesn't necessarily negate the critical insight informing attempts to deal with history contingently, namely that history, understood as the unfolding of an imminent necessity, delineates a form of unfreedom. Rather, Marx grounds the historically dynamic character. Rather, Marx grounds the modern world. The historically dynamic character and structural change that are the modern world in imperative science strains that are historically specific to capitalist society rejected that, although people in capitalist society have rejected that onto the world. Marx grounds the Far from viewing history affirmatory, Marx grounds the directional dynamic in the category of capital, as a form of thereby grasping it as a form of heteronomy, as a form of domination. From the standpoint, his critique then is not undertaken from the standpoint of history and labor, 
as historical dynamics of capitalism, on the contrary, of the historical dynamic of capitalism have become the seemingly ontological centrality of labor by the same become the objects of Marx's mature theory. By the same token, Marx's mature theory no longer purports to be a trans historically valid theory of history and social life. But it's self-consciously historically specific that claims for itself and calls into question any approach that claims for itself universal the transhistorical analysis in this reading. The critical thrust of Marx's analysis in this reading entails a critique of totality and of the dialectical logic of dynamic form of domination as expressions of the temporally dynamic form of domination characteristic of capitalist society and it seeks to uncover the conditions of their over the conditions of their overcoming. This differs fundamentally that insists from post-structuralist critiques of totality that insist on the ontological primacy of heteronymous history. Marx's critique of heteronymous history differs fundamentally from such approaches in as much as it does not regard such history as a result of a narrative, a master narrative, that can be done away with discursively, but as the expression of a structure of temporal domination. From this point of view, any attempt to recover historical Agency. In ways that deny or by insisting on contingency, in ways that deny or obscure the temporally dynamic form of domination, characteristic of capital, is ironically these profoundly disempowered. Are based on a reading. These contentions are based on a reading that considers the most fundamental category of Marx's mature critique with reference to the heteronymous dynamics that characterizes capital. Categories such as value within the traditional framework, surplus value, categories such as value, commodity, surplus value, capital, have that generally been taken as economic categories and then that affirm labor as the source of all social wealth and demonstrate the centrality of class-based exploitation in capitalism. Such interpretations attribute to Marx such interpretations attribute to Marx as an activity a transhistorical understanding of labor as an activity mediating human and nature, which is posited as the source of wealth in all societal framework. Labor is in capitalism within this traditional framework. Labor is hindered from being fully realized where transhistorical labor would be realized in a society where transhistorical labor has openly emerged. This notion as the regulating principle of society. This notion, of course, is bound to that of socialism as the self-realization of the proletariat. Labor here provides in the standpoint of the critique of capitalist economy, however. A close reading of Marx's mature critique of political economy, however, calls into question the presuppositions of Marx's traditional interpretation. First of all, Marx indicates that his fundamental category should not be understood in narrow economic terms. But as forms of being, of social dynamics form, historically determinations of the mode of social existing, that are at one and the same time forms of social being that are at one and the same time subjective and objective. Those categories. Moreover, and this is crucial, those categories should not be understood as transhistorical but as even historically specific, such as money and labor, that appear categories such as money and labor that appear transhistorical because of their abstract and general character 
are valid in their abstract generality. This applies to the category of value according to Marx. In the good of this applies to the Marx category of value as presents value in the good of the foundation of Marx explicitly presents value so as the foundation of bourgeois production. But he doesn't do so in just specific to capital. But as a form of wealth by historically specific to capitalism that is constituted by direct human labor time what he calls real wealth. He which distinguishes that from what he calls and real wealth, on which is a function of, of the output of goods and is based knowledge. on a number of natural and social factors, including knowledge. Of capitalism Marx proceeds to outline the fundamental, the fundamental contradiction of capitalism as one between value and the, the result of the development of capitalism's underlying social forms the dual character of capitalism's underlying social forms generates huge increases in productivity, which give rise to the historical possibility that value itself could be abolished, and that production could be organized on a new basis, one not dependent on the expenditure of direct human labor and production. At the same time, however, Value this remains in the necessary condition of capitalism. Potential generated by the system this contradiction between the actuality potential actuality generated by the system based on value the and its actuality indicates entails the that for Marx, of value the abolition of capitalism entails the abolition of value and value creating lifting the self realization. This implies that far from the simplifying the self realization of the proletariat, the, the abolition of capitalism would entail the self abolition. Volume the one of Das Kapital is the rigorous elaboration of Volume the one of Das Kapital it begins with is the, the rigorous elaboration of this analysis. Which is treated by Marx it begins as with the category of commodity, form, which is treated by Marx the as a historically specific social form it does that constitutes the defining core of capitalist modernity. It does not refer to commodity as, not refer to as they might exist in other societies, but rather and it does not refer to of capitalism, mm. but rather it is a structuring principle of capitalist mm. society characterized, characterized by a historically specific Marx character, use value, and value. To unfold the nature and Marx saw in this capital to unfold the nature and underlying dynamic of capitalism at the heart of analysis from this point of departure. That labor and capital at the heart of his analysis is the idea that labor and capitalism as is an not only labor as we commonly think of it, as an activity mediating the interactions of humans and nature, what he calls socially mediating activity, but also has an unique socially mediating activity, what he calls abstract labor, that is not an intrinsic feature of laboring activity as such. In a society in which commodity is the basic structuring category of the In a society in which the commodity is the basic structuring category of the whole, labor and its products are not socially distributed by traditional norms or overt relations in power, as is the case in other societies. Those relations. Instead, by labor itself replaces those relations by serving as a quasi objective means of obtaining the products of others. In serving, that is to say, labor not only mediates production, but in such a distribution. Labor and its products. In serving as such a means, labor and its products, in effect, Preempt that function on the part of manifest social in relations words, in Marx's and replace them. The notion of in other words, of in Marx's material works, is not the notion of centrality of labor to social life is not a transhistorical proposition. It refers to the historically specific form of social mediation by labor in mentally of a form of social mediation that fundamentally characterizes that society. Analysis. 
the real social relation according to this analysis a real social relation of the qualitatively specific overt are very different from the qualitatively specific overt social relations such as kinship what relations that characterize other societies is a what ultimately structures capitalist society is a form of social relations characterized by an abstract, quasi-objective, formal, general, homogeneous dimension. This is the real social relation. It doesn't hide the, the real social relation of the social mediation underlying capitalism. The abstract the character of the social mediation by underlying the form capitalism of wealth is at the same time expressed by the form of wealth as I noted dominant in that society. Marx's labor theory of value frequently is as I noted above as a labor Marx's labor theory of value frequently is then understood as a labor theory of wealth places. One that argues that labor at all times and in Marx all places is the, the only social source of wealth. Marx, however, analyzes value as a historically specific role of form of wealth, which is bound to in the historically capital. unique role of labor and like capitalism. <laughs> Indus Capital, like in the wealth, he explicitly distinguishes value from material wealth, which is measured by the amount produced and is a function of knowledge, social organization, and natural conditions in addition to labor. Value is constituted solely by the expenditure of socially necessary labor time. I'm going to skip this. This is going to be a little complicated. Now, I, I, this is going to be a little complicated, but I, I want to it hasn't been all, draw your attention to the significance. I want to draw your attention to the significance in terms of much determination of the magnitude of value in terms of socially necessary labor. But it delineates a social. This is not simply discriminatory. But it delineates a socially general, completely norm. Abstract Production must norm. conform if it is to, to this prevailing abstract norm. overarching norm that it is to generate the full value of its product. Example, the time frame, frame as that is the hour, variable. for example, it becomes constituted as an in, in the hour variable. Before the 14th Incidentally, for those who don't know, the hour it was before the 14th century used to change with the, the hour season. as an independent it was not an independent variable. It's a very slow rise. The hour as an independent variable emerges with the very slow rise of capitalism. But that's a the amount of value produced per unit time. Is a function of that the time amount time of value produced per unit time the same is a function of that time period of individual variation. It remains the, the same regardless of individual now, variations or the level of productivity. Will get us to the dynamic. Now, it's a peculiarity of value that this will get us to the dynamic. The amount of use value. That although increased productivity increases the amount of use value produced per unit time, in the magnitude it results value. only in short term increases in the magnitude of value created per unit, unit time. In general, once the, the increases value in productivity become general, falls back. the magnitude of value generated per unit time the falls back is a kind of a to its original base level. level. In order to stand still. The result is a kind of a treadmill. Higher Bruce levels in order to stand still. Result in great increases. <coughs> higher levels of productivity. But not result in great increases in material wealth. But not in proportional long term increases in value per unit time. This in turn leads to still further increases in productivity. In other words, what Marx and this is on a very abstract level, what Marx is doing with the theory of value here is trying to explain why capitalism has been characterized by pressures for increasing productivity in ways in which no other society ever has. Both expresses and constitutes this treadmill dynamic both expresses and constitutes 
the socially or temporal form of domination norm of the socially general abstract compelling norm of socially necessary labor time is the first determination in the domination of the historically specific abstract form of social domination, which is infinite social capitalism, and that form of domination is the domination of formal temporality. By a historically specific form of temporality, abstract Newtonian time, which is constituted historically with the commodity form. It would, however, be one-sided to view temporality however be one sided only in terms to view temporality in capitalism only in terms of abstract Newtonian time as empty homogeneous time as Walter Benjamin did. Its temporal forms once capitalism is fully developed its temporal forms generate ongoing increases in productivity. These increases do not change However, the amount of value produced per change per unit time, time as we've seen. Of what However, they do change the determination of what counts as a given unit remains constant. The unit of time remains constant. Changes in productivity push that unit yet changes in productivity push the unit of time forward. In 1850 looks the same the unit of time long, in 18 as the unit of time in 19 looks the same at 60 minutes long as the unit of time in 1950 they're not the same of time this movement, the movement i want to call the movement of time and i'm going to not call that the movement story. in time the redetermination and i'm going to call that time unit the redetermination of the abstract constant time unit Redetermines the compulsion associated with that unit. Requires a necessary so, in other words, the movement of time requires a necessary dimension. So, whereas Lukács thinks that historical time is the opposite of abstract time and represents the possibility of emancipation, I'm suggesting that historical time and abstract time together constitute the form of domination of capitalism. The form of domination characteristic of capitalism. In other words, the form of domination characteristic of capitalist society are quasi-objective forms of social mediation. By determinate forms of social constituted by determinate forms of social practice of the people engaged that become quasi-independent and exert of the people engaged in those practices and exert a form of compulsion on them and on all members of the society. The result, as I've tried to suggest, is a new historic, as I've tried to suggest, specific form is a new historically historically specific one form of social domination. Personal, increasingly rational one that subjects people to impersonal, increasingly rationalized structural imperatives and constraints that cannot adequately be grasped in terms of class domination of social or more generally in terms of the concrete domination of social groupings or institutional agencies of the state or the economy. And although it has no determinate locus practice, and although constituted by determinate forms of social practice, appears not to be social at all. I'm suggesting, in other words, for those of abstract who are with domination, that Marx's analysis of abstract domination of what is a more rigorous and determinate analysis of what Foucault attempted to grasp with his notion of power in the modern world. Moreover, Marx's analysis reveals the one side the form of domination of notion of power is not only said the form of domination Marx analyzes is not only cellular and spatial, it is at one and the same time 
but also temporal. And overarching. It is at one and the same time capillary and overarching. The peculiar treadmill dynamic, I've outlined very The peculiar treadmill dynamic is generative I've outlined of a very, very complex, nonlinear is generative dynamic of a very complex, nonlinear historical dynamic and most that characterizes one capitalist modernity. And most observers on the one hand, view one side or the other by ongoing transformation. On the one hand, of production it is characterized by ongoing transformation on of production the and of social life. Entails the on the other hand, the historical dynamic entails the ongoing reconstitution of, of its own fundamental condition as an unchanging feature of social and life. Social media namely that also value is remains effective and that labor. social mediation and that ultimately remains, remains effective to by labor and that living labor remains integral to, to the total social process of production regardless of the level of power Ceaselessly the historical the dynamic of capitalism while regenerating ceaselessly what generates what is new as I will while elaborate. regenerating what it is both generates the possibility of as I will elaborate labor, it both generates the possibility of another organization of labor and of social life and at the same time hinders that possibility this of being realized is at the heart of the category of capitalism. This dynamic which marks initially is at the heart of the category of capital as self which marks initially introduced as a category as self valorizing value emotion. It is a category of movement that is value in motion. It's significant the category that in Das Kapital, when Marx introduces he does so with the, the category of capitalism for the first time that Hegel used. He does so with, with exactly the, the same language that Hegel used the self with reference to the guys in his phenomenology, and if you think the self-moving substance the that is subject doesn't make any sense. And if you think this is an economic, the language then just doesn't make any sense. But Marx is presenting a different In so doing, then when he was young, Marx is presenting a different critique of Hegel. And then when he was notion of history as what he is suggesting as the is that Hegel's notion of history as having a logic is as the dialectical unfolding of a subject is valid but only for capitalism there Marx does not identify that subject moreover Marx does not identify that subject or even with humanitarian subject instead with the proletariat or even with humanity, a dynamic structure of domination. That although a dynamic structure of abstract domination, that although constituted by Marx's mature becomes independent of their will, no longer entails Marx's mature critique of Hegel. Then no longer entails of the latter's idealist an anthropological inversion of the latter's idealist dialectic. It's the other Hegel. And this is provocative. Materialist justification. It's the dial. It's Hegel's Marx implicitly argues justification. that the rational core of Hegel's Marx implicitly argues that the rational core of Hegel's dialectic is, of is its idealist character. Constituted. It is the expression of a mode of domination. Constituted. By relations that acquire a quasi independent form of compulsion vis a vis the individuals, and that exert a form of compulsion on them, are and dialectic. that because of their peculiar dualistic character, are dialectical so in nature. From this brief, if somewhat dense, I'll so you'll note that from this brief, if somewhat dense, I'll totality that the historical subject. Have now become the objects and the labor constituting it have now become the objects of critique in Marxism. The understanding of capitalism is complex dynamic I've outlined is the understanding of capitalism's complex dynamic I've outlined is relevant that of the environmental to the contemporary dual crisis of my that of environmental degradation 
and March the demise of the laboring society and capital. March is categories of shortness value and capital. Once you allow don't see them only as categories of exploitation, allow for a critical social analysis of the trajectory of growth the and the structure of production in modern society. Especially in the, form the temporal of dimension of value, especially in the form of what Marx calls relative surplus value, underlies a determinate pattern of growth which gives rise to increases in material wealth this far greater than those of surplus value. For accelerating this results in pressures for accelerating in and accelerating no matter how many goods for raw materials and hence accelerating demands for raw materials and energy destruction, which contribute centrally to the accelerating destruction of the natural environment. Within this framework, then, the problem with economic growth and capitalism. Within this framework, then, the problem with economic growth and capitalism is not only that it's crisis ridden, rather the form of growth itself is problem. If the ultimate goal of the trajectory of growth would be different, if the ultimate goal of production were increased quantities of goods rather than surplus. I have a paragraph saying that there, it, there's also an analysis. I have a paragraph saying that there, it, there's also an analysis of the form of production in capitalism itself, which is not as a technical for their own process, but which is controlled by capitalist production for their own end, but rather the material form of production itself is molded by the social form of capital. What is generated, what, I repeat, is generated that the logic of the I repeat indicates once again that, that for the logic the of the capital indicates not that for Marx the abolition of capitalism would not entail the self-realization of the proletariat, the class, but it's self-abolition. You take Marx's value analysis seriously. The class, the class, you take Marx's value analysis seriously. Is the, the class without which capital cannot exist is the proletariat. It's not the proletariat. Marx develops this argument and the lot non-linear nature. Marx develops this argument and the lot non-linear nature of development in which he argues in his treatment of accumulation, in which he argues that capitalism drive for increasing productivity increasing the generates a long-term tendency towards increasing the proportion of objectified science and technology relative to living labor. <coughs> Is that less and less a long-term consequence of this tendency is that less and less labor is required for higher levels of product one result based on newer production processes. One result is a tendency for the creation of a relatively superfluous working population, the so-called industrial reserve army of labor. As an account of how now, this analysis traditionally has been read as an account of how capitalism exerts downward pressure on wages. Relatedly, it has also been taken as a critique of capitalism's inability to provide full employment. This reading, however, is incomplete. And hence it's relevant. It misses an important thrust of Marx's argument. And hence it's relevant Marx's chapter on accumulation should be read as the culmination of Marx's chapter on accumulation should be read as the culmination of his argument that the long term tendency of technology is the development of a technological renders the material productive apparatus that renders the production of material wealth essentially independent of value, that is of direct human labor time. However, expenditure, because value is constantly reconstituted. Because value is 
constantly recomposing the going to be as the basis <laughs> of the system. <laughs> The growing superfluity of labor of the growing superfluity begins to take the form of the growing superfluity of an increasing large portion of working population of an increase in the permanently unemployed and the precarious, the underemployed. This development goes far beyond periodic expansion and contraction of the industrial reserve army with its downward pressure on wages, and it calls into question the demand for full employment as the solution to it expresses in inverted forms. The Rather, it expresses in inverted form the growing from a period of linear possibility, far from appearing as a linear possibility, and the possibility of the abolition of proletarian nature, and hence the emergence of the possibility of the future on the labor in which surplus production no longer must be based at the same on the labor of an oppressed class is at the same time the emergence of the possibility of a disastrous development in which the growing superfluity of labor is expressed as the growing superfluity of people. The possibility of the future. In other words, is at one and the same time. The possibility of a future possibility is at one and the same time. The emergence of the possibility of an unbelievable level of barbarism. It and the two are tied together. Considered retrospectively, it's become evident that the social considered retrospective cultural configuration of that the social, political, economic, cultural configuration of capital's hegemony has varied in the century liberal capitalism. From mercantilism century through 19th century liberal capitalism to contemporary 20th century state central capitalism to contemporary neoliberal global has capitalism. Has a number of penetrating Each configuration of has elicited a number of penetrating equitable growth, for example, of exploitation or and uneven equitable growth, for example, or technocratic bureaucratic modes of domination. Each of these As critiques, now, however, is in, cannot be identified fully. As we now say, of its history, capital cannot be identified fully now, what with any of its historical considerations. Now, one of the reasons why my talk has been as abstract as it has between approaches is I that am trying to differentiate between approaches that, however sophisticated, Ultimately, our critiques of one configuration understanding of capital and an approach that would allow for an understanding of capital as the core of the social formation, separable from its various surface configuration. As the core of the social formation, the distinction between capital as the core of the social formation has become and historically specific configuration of the two has become increasingly important. Conflating the two like has resulted Marxism in significant misrecognition that the coming social I'd like you to recall Marx's assertion that the coming social revolution must drive its poetry from the future unlike earlier revolutions that focused on the past misrecognized their own historical content. I want to suggest that too much in this light social traditional Marxism backed in in this light traditional Marxism backed into a future it did not rather than pointing to the overcoming like Benjamin's angel. Rather than pointing to the overcoming of that focus entirely it entailed a misrecognition that focused entirely on private ownership of the market conflated capital and its 19th century configuration and consequently it implicitly affirmed a new state-centric configuration that emerged out of the crisis of liberal capitalism. 
The unintended affirmation of a new configuration of capital can be seen more recently in the anti-Hegelian turn to Nietzsche, characteristic of much post doctrinal thought since the early 1970s. Such thought arguably also due to the future it did not adequately grasp. In rejecting the source of state-centric and on that basis traditional Marxism implicitly affirmed and on that basis criticized the Marxism, it did so in a manner that is proven to be incapable of critically grasping the neoliberal global order that has superseded states and our capital relations in the past century then have not the only historical transformations of the past century then have not only revealed the weaknesses of much traditional Marxism as well as of various forms of critical post-Marxism but also suggest for the central significance of a critique of capital by attempting for an adequate critical Marxist conception of capital by attempting to rethink of the Marxist conception of capital I am as the essential core of the social formation, I am trying to contribute today to the recombination of a robust critique of capitalism today that free from the conceptual shadows of approaches that identify capitalism with one of its historical configurations could potentially be adequate to our social universe. Thank you.